Good evening, friends. Good evening. Welcome to the Panorama of Prophecy. We're so thankful to see each of you here. And this is the part of the program, one of my favorites, because it's just all over the place, but it's all dealing with Bible principles, Bible truth. And so we appreciate your questions. All right, are you ready to start? I think so. Did you Let's have see. a good day off? Yeah. Good. Mrs. Batchelor and I had a lot of fun yesterday. In 24 hours, we drove probably seven hours, eight hours, and uh, we were out in the mountains last night and yesterday, uh, probably 20 miles from the nearest person up in the woods. It I was, was there. great. Well, you, you and know, I are I one flesh, there. so that doesn't count. Oh, okay. <laughs> we did a lot of raking yesterday. <laughs> <laughs> she did a lot of raking yesterday. <laughs> All right. All right, here we go. Why does the temple need cleansing, and what is being cleansed? In our last study, we talked about the cleansing of the sanctuary, and we discovered that you could look at three different sanctuaries. You, well, of course, you get the physical building. Uh, then you have the sanctuary. God has a genuine sanctuary in heaven. It says the earthly one was after the pattern that Moses received regarding the true uh, tabernacle, you read in Hebrews, in heaven. We learn that our bodies are a temple of the Holy Spirit and that the church collectively is a temple. Jesus said, destroy this temple made with hands, and three days I will make one without hands. And it says he spoke of his body. The church is called the body of Christ, and we are living stones. The physical temple just needed the normal cleaning and stuff that any building would need. Sins were spiritually stored in the temple in heaven. And they were transferred from the person when they confessed their sins on the head of the, the goat or the lamb or the, the oxen. And then it was brought in. They'd take some of the blood and they'd sprinkle it before the Lord. So separating the people from their sins. And they're sort of symbolically placed there. The end of the year, there was a beautiful service called the Day of Atonement when God purged the nation from all their record of sin. And it was time of uh, humbling before the Lord and a new year, a new beginning. And that's part of our lesson tonight, New Beginning. So, and then when Jesus cleansed the earthly sanctuary, they'd gotten into, uh, they turned the temple into a flea market. Mm -hmm. And you know, there are some churches today that spend more time talking about um, buying and selling than they do the word of the Lord. Mm -hmm. And so I think if Jesus was here today, there'd be some uh, cleansing of the tabernacle again. <laughs> What was in the most holy place after the temple was rebuilt by Ezra and Nehemiah? What represented the mercy seat? Yes, we, we shared that uh, when Nebuchadnezzar destroyed Solomon's temple, prior to that, it's, and this is just some speculation, uh, Jeremiah and some of the priests hid the ark. They knew that the city was surrounded and doomed. It does tell us that the articles of the sanctuary uh, the other things, a candlestick, table of showbread, they were carried off to Babylon, the holy vessels. Remember King Belshazzar was praising, in Daniel chapter 5, he was praising his idols with the holy vessels from the temple that had been captured. The ark's never mentioned. So when they rebuilt the temple, after they came back from the Babylonian captivity, they built it in the hope that they would relocate or find the ark. But there was no ark in the holy of holies. So they would just uh, pray to the Lord. And of course, especially after the veil was rent, when Jesus died on the cross, uh, that, that's when the glory was departed. The whole purpose of that sacrificial system pointed to Jesus, the Lamb of God. Please explain Mark 16, verse 18. What was Jesus talking about? Yeah, this is at the end of the Gospel of Mark. And um, you, you only find this in his Gospel. I'm going to go back to verse 17. These signs will follow those who believe. In my name, they will cast out devils. They will speak with new tongues. Of course, that was fulfilled in uh, Acts chapter 2. They will take up serpents. Now, that doesn't mean that um, believers are supposed to go on a rattlesnake roundup or a serpent safari. And, be, and there's some churches that interpret it that way. He just means that if you are bitten by a serpent, sometimes they latch onto you. It means you'll take them up but you'll not be harmed. This exact thing happened to Paul in Acts 27, I think it is, where um, he was putting some wood on a fire and a serpent woke up from the heat, latched onto his hand. It was a deadly snake. Everyone saw him get bit. It, it, he, he shook it off into the fire and they wa waited for him to swell up and die. 
nothing happened. He was immune to the uh, venom because of a miracle of God. A and he said, You'll, if you drink any deadly thing, people may try to poison you. Uh, there's several stories of how God delivered his uh, apostles from uh, murder attempts. You remember when they stoned Paul. Paul was stoned, and he got up and walked away. Nothing happened to him. And then there are other examples in history where the Apostle John, before he was in Patmos, they tried to destroy him in boiling oil. Mm -hmm. And the early church fathers said he stepped in like he was in a warm bath, and they couldn't believe that it didn't harm him. They were so frightened, the, the um, Caesar sent him to Patmos. They didn't want to try and execute him twice. So Jesus was just saying, I will protect you as you go out and do my work. What angel is God referring to in Exodus 23, verses 20 to 23? Who will guide the Israelite in which way to go, and who has his name in him? Yeah, it's the same angel that's mentioned in Deuteronomy 18, and it tells us that um, uh, I will send my angel before you. Stephen gives us the answer to that in the New Testament when he's talking about the wilderness journey. He said, Christ was that angel that led them through the wilderness. It wasn't one angel named Tom, Dick, or Harry that did it. But uh, you can read where Moses said in Deuteronomy 18, uh, the Lord your God will raise up unto a prophet like me, him you shall hear. And so Christ was leading his people. Paul says, 1 Corinthians 10, Jesus was the rock that followed him. Now the word angel there does not mean, the word angel is a word, sometimes it even talks about a person, like David was called an angel. It means messenger. Mm -hmm. It's in Greek, it's angelos. It just means a messenger. Uh, Jesus was the mediator, the messenger of God that led them through the wilderness through his spirit. All right. Revelation says the wicked are cast into the lake of fire following the judgment. Is anyone burning in hell now? We have a lesson coming on Revelation chapter 20. And I just put that in there because we've had several questions on what does the Bible say about that. Keep coming if it's okay. Hold that thought. Some of your questions, you're thinking he's ignoring my question. We are, because the subject is still coming. We're about halfway through our series now, I think. Are we? Yep. All right. What are the best Bible prophecies for me to share with friends that don't wholly believe in the Bible? Good question. You know, now this is my personal opinion. I think some of the most convincing and compelling prophecies are the ones about Jesus' first coming. If you look, for example, uh, in Psalm 22, and this is a prophecy that talks about uh, the first coming of Jesus and the sufferings. There's several psalms that are called Messianic Psalms, and this is a great example of that. In Psalm 22, uh, the first words are, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? What did Jesus say on the cross? Same phrase. Mm -hmm. You read on, and it says in verse 7, all those who see me ridicule me. They shoot out the lip, they shake their head. You can read where it says, um, let him deliver him since he delighted in him. That's exactly what they said to Jesus on the cross. Verse 16, for dogs have surrounded me, the congregation of the wicked, they enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I can count all my bones. That means that he's uh, emaciated. They look and they stare at me. They divided my garments among them, which they did when Jesus was crucified. And for my low clothing, they cast lots. They cast lots for Jesus' clothing. That's a lot of uh, specific details in one psalm. But what about the prophecies that said what town he'd be born in? Prophecy said he'd be born in Bethlehem. That he'd be sold for silver and the amount, 30 pieces of silver. Then it says that that money would be cast to the potter in the house of the Lord. The Bible says Judas cast down the money in the house of the Lord. They bought a potter's field with the money. And you just go on and on through the prophecies about Christ's first coming, that he'd be betrayed by a friend about he riding into Jerusalem on a donkey. Mm -hmm. So you get a list, you can find it online really easy. Prophecies of Christ's first coming, and there's like 50 prophecies. It's very specific. We know from the Dead Sea Scrolls, these were written before Christ lived. Yes. And they all happen so uh, precisely that I think that would strengthen the faith of someone who doubts the inspiration of the Bible. Amen. All right, in Genesis 7, verses two and three, the Bible says that you shall take with you seven each of every clean animal, a male and his female, 
to each of the animals that are unclean, a male and his female. Also, seven each of the birds of the air, male and female, to keep the species alive on the, fa on, on the face of all the earth. Does that make 14 clean animals? Uh, of the clean animals, yes, that would be 14 pairs. But uh, Seven pairs. Uh, yeah, yeah, seven pairs, sorry. 14 total, thank you. But um, the, the thing to keep in mind is, the first thing Noah did uh, after he, the ark landed, if you can use that term, uh, is that he offered sacrifice. You are only supposed to offer clean animals as sacrifice. Nowhere in the Bible does it say they offered a vulture or a skunk or an unclean animal to the Lord. You don't offer a dog or a pig. That's what the enemies of the uh, Jews did when they captured the temple. They offered a pig in the altar to um, outrage them, yeah, to uh, desecrate it. Um, so some animals like goats, sheep, oxen, usually they operate where you've got one bull and he's got a little harem. It's, they don't pair up like doves do. And so some of the males uh, were probably offered as sacrifice afterward. The other thing that happened is all the vegetation had been destroyed. And that's the first time you find man was really using animals as food. In the Garden of Eden, what was the food? Adam and Eve were vegetarians. You realize that? Fruits, vegetables. Are, fruits, are some of you fruits. worried about heaven now? Do you know you'll be a vegetarian there? <laughs> no Big Mac, no nuggets. It's you're all going to be a tree of life and good things. So there's 14. 14 animals. All my life I thought there were just seven clean. Yeah, no, pairs. All right. Two times seven. It's so much fun to learn new things, huh? Are we to daily strive for holiness? Can one obtain holiness on this earth? God will never ask you to do something if it can't be done. And the Bible tells us in holiness, pursue peace, in Hebrews rather, pursue peace with all men and holiness without which no one will see God. Jesus said, blessed are the pure in heart for they shall what? See God. See God. God is calling us to holiness. Now, when we say that, some people get frightened and think, oh man, I've got so many problems. Holiness means that um, you've got a life where you're consecrated to do God's will when you know God's will. Mm -hmm. And there's a learning process. But Christians are not just forgiven. He transforms us. Amen. And if you're a thief, he'll help you stop. If you have a problem with the drugs or alcohol, he can give you the victory. He did for Amen. me. So you'll never convince me God can't change you. All right. Please explain why James, the brother of Jesus, is, the, is older than Jesus. Yes. Uh, that one of those last books in the New Testament is the book of James. This is not James, the brother of John the Apostle. This is James, the brother of Jesus. And he was an older brother. Now, stay with me. Um, most people don't realize what most scholars do understand is that Joseph's probably had a family before he married Mary, a wife had died, Jesus' brothers, it mentions four brothers by name, and it says sisters, it doesn't tell us how, how many, but it says two, it must be two to have sisters. Um, they're never mentioned, well, first of all, when Jesus is on the cross, who does he uh, commit his mother's care to? To John. The Apostle John. Why not one of her, if it was her kids, why not one of them? It would have been considered disrespectful if Jesus was the oldest for the firstborn son to leave the family business and go out and become an itinerant minister. The firstborn sons always sort of took care of the family business. And um, so for, for that reason and several others, the other thing is Joseph must have been a little older than Mary because you realize once Jesus begins his ministry, many believe Joseph had died at that point it always talks about Jesus. and Sometimes she brought her stepchildren with her to talk to uh, Jesus. Joseph is never mentioned again following Jesus' 12-year-old foray into the temple. All right. So he was a blended family. It was, yeah. Probably jo Joseph had been married younger and had some children. His wife died, and then he married Mary. So your Christmas cards where you see Joseph and Mary and the little baby going off to Egypt, you got to add in about six other kids into that picture. <laughs> if there are two tribes of Israel that were from Joseph's sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, wouldn't that make 14 tribes instead of 12? Can if you, you also, yeah. explain this discrepancy? If you also add Joseph as one and then his sons, that would add up to 14. But 15. quick story uh, is 
When Joseph was sold by his brothers, he was separated from his family in Egypt for about 30 years. When reunited, Jacob said, I am going to now count your two sons as members of the tribe in your place. You get two lots. So Joseph is no longer counted until you get to Revelation chapter um, 7. Uh, instead, it was Ephraim and Manasseh. Well, that would make 13 tribes. If you've got 12 sons of Jacob, they, were, they had one sister named Dinah. You have 12 sons of Jacob. And then he says, I'm going to also split Joseph so he gets, it's going to be two. Then you got 13 because it's, instead of Joseph, it's Ephraim and Manasseh. But then after the Mount Sinai incident with the golden calf, Levi was faithful when much of the rest of the children of Israel, they followed after this golden calf. God said, Levi are going to be the priests for the rest of the nation. They will not get an inheritance because I want them to scatter like salt all around the land of Israel, the promised land, and be the teachers of the law for the people. It says, your inheritance is me. I am your inheritance. So now when they counted the 12 tribes, they counted the 12 tribes, Ephraim and Manasseh and Issachar and Zebulun and Dan and Naphtali, so forth. And Levi was a priest for all of them. So that's how you got the number 13. But that's how you get 12. Yeah, 12 is, is counting just the sons of Joseph uh, as two. Right, and okay. But you don't count Joseph then. No. How do we Did know? Did that make sense? It's, it's okay. a little it's convoluted. One. Some of you are... <laughs> okay. Yeah, it was a little convoluted, but okay. that's okay. How do we know that the Protestant Bible is the right one compared to the Catholic Bible that has more books in it? Did the Catholic Bible um, exist first? And why were these books eliminated from the Bible? Yeah, good question. Uh, the, the, there's a difference between the Catholic or Douay version and most Protestant Bibles. Now, all of them have the same number of books in the New Testament. Uh, the Catholic Bible has seven additional books that are considered by Protestants apocryphal or doubtful books. Now, there's some books that Catholics also think are doubtful that people have applied to be included in Scripture. And the reason is that the Protestant scholars, when they were assembling the canon of Scripture, this would be the canon of Scripture, uh, they came up with a total of 66 because these books were corroborated by other Bible writers and referenced by the church, early church fathers as sacred. Some of the apocryphal books, like First and Second Maccabees, and that's not so bad as Baruch and, and Tobit and some of the other books, they appear, they're never referenced by any other Bible writer or father, and they seem to be some of them of a dubious origin. So they thought they'll probably play it safe. Maccabees probably has some good accurate history in it. But not every, you realize not every book is considered a sacred or a holy book to be part of the Bible. Okay. Did Job live after or before the flood? Job, yeah, I remember hearing a pastor, he preached a sermon on Job, <laughs> the book of Job. It was a really good sermon, but I could see he was a self-taught pastor, but it's really actually a very good sermon. But I, I kept thinking about the book of Job. <laughs> anyway, Job is a real character. It says he lived in the land of Uz, a perfect and an upright man that feared God and hated evil. And um, we, we look at the different names of the characters, and it appears that Job and his friends were descendants of Edom. They were descendants from uh, Ishmael. And because some of those very names, uh, like Eliphaz the Temanite, uh, Bildad the Shuhite, uh, they're mentioned other places in the genealogies. It also, you look at how long Job lived, people during that time were still living 150 plus years, which is about the amount of time that Job lived. So we believe in the land of Uz, it was probably uh, in the land of um, what you would call, you know, south of Edom or south of uh, Amman right now. The climate was different back then. That's why you had all these flocks and herds, mm -hmm. because it was past, beautiful pasture land back there. The, the climate there changed. Well, land of Israel is called the land flowing with milk and honey. You go there now, it's a land of rocks. Yep. But they're sort of resurrecting it. It's actually, they're doing quite a bit with agriculture there. All right. So this is our last question. Okay. What is the right response if your wife asks you, how do I look? And unfortunately, she doesn't look flattering. Do you lie or do you tell the truth? Is that a called loaded question? I put that in there. No, I didn't. <laughs> You know, Jesus said, uh, 
there are many things I have to say to you, but you are not able to bear them now. <laughs> I would always say, amazing. Because that could be taken any way, right? <laughs> I know better than to even ask that question. So you anyway. look lovely, dear, and I'm Thank telling the truth. Thank you. All right. Welcome, friends, to the Panorama of Prophecy. Both those of you who are here in Granite Bay and our friends who are watching from all over the world. We're just getting emails and testimonies from all kinds of different countries. Some people have taken it upon themselves to translate the messages in different languages for groups. And we're just so excited about the, um, the impact of God's word. Our lesson today is a very important subject. It, it may be one of the most important. And some of you are gonna think, Pastor Doug, are you pulling a fast one? Why are you dropping this subject into a prophecy seminar? As we uh, move on, I think you'll understand why it belongs and why it's so important. The lesson title is The River of Life. And I would like to direct your attention to a story that you find in the second book of Kings. Second Kings chapter five, it tells us about a character. He's an Assyrian by the name, or Assyrian by the name of Naaman. And it says, Naaman was a mighty man with his master. He was a valiant man. He's well known, he was successful, and by him the Lord had given deliverance to Syria. Wealthy man, courageous, he was the general for the king. But at the end of that first verse, it's got uh, five words, it says, but he was a leper. Everything changes. I mean, what profit is it if you gain the whole world and you're dying of a deadly contagious disease for which there is no cure? He was wealthy. He was strong, had a great reputation. It says he was an honorable man. Everyone in town knew him. But one day he came down with this terrible, dreaded, contagious disease of leprosy. The Bible often compares leprosy to sin, you may know. Well, the story goes on to tell that Naaman bought a slave girl that worked in his household. He's a wealthy man. And she had been captured from Israel. This little girl, she had probably heard the story of Joseph, how Joseph found himself a slave in a foreign land. And he said, well, if I'm going to be a good slave, God's got a reason for me to be here. I'm going to trust the Lord. If God was able to use Joseph in that capacity, then perhaps he can use me. And when she found out that her master had leprosy, she said to her mistress, she said, for if he, Naaman, would go to Israel, the prophet there, Elisha, would heal him of his leprosy. See, Elisha had a double portion of Elijah's spirit, and there's no record in the Bible of anybody coming to Elisha with a problem, except he helped them and often performed incredible miracles. Well, you know, when you're dying, you're desperate, and you'll even believe the story of this young girl. Elisha had never healed anyone of leprosy before. But Naaman said, you know, there's hope. There's a great prophet in Israel. We've heard about him, and and this Jewish girl says that if I go there, that he can heal me of my leprosy. The king says, I don't want to lose you. You're my best general. You're a great man. I'll send millions of dollars in healing money or reward money for the prophet, and I'll send some soldiers with you. Go down there and be healed. So Naaman goes down to Israel, and they'd often been enemies, so it's kind of an odd request. I mean, here Naaman has been the general who has attacked Israel. Uh, there's this brief period of truce. So he goes down there and gives a message to the king of Israel that says, um, king of Syria sent a message to the king of Israel. I sent Naaman, my servant, unto you so you can heal him of his leprosy. King of Israel said, what? What am I now, some faith healer? Well, word came to Elisha what had happened. He sent a message to the king of Israel. He said, send him to me that you may know that there is a prophet in Israel. And so Naaman comes to the house of Elisha the prophet, but Elisha doesn't even come out. He sends out his servant, Gehazi, and he's got a very short, simple message. Go and wash in the Jordan River seven times, and your flesh shall be restored to you again, and you'll be clean. Now, uh, evidently, his leprosy had advanced, which says your flesh will be restored. He may have already gotten to the stage in his leprosy where sometimes you can lose d digits or piece of them, through injury, and, and it was pretty far advanced. 
Well, Nahum says, wash in the Jordan River. Well, the Jordan River was not the best river in the world. Uh, matter of fact, in the summertime, the Jordan is like a series of stagnating pools. Now, what is implied when someone says, go wash? What are they telling you? You're dirty. What, what is implied if someone says, go wash seven times? Some of you and your kids, your parents said, go take seven baths. When sometimes you may remember the days where family would draw a bath and all the kids would use the same water. Nobody wanted to be the last one in. But you always put the dirtiest one in last, right? Some reason, I always got last into the bathtub. But what does it mean if someone tells you to take seven baths in a dirty river? The Jordan River, it's either green or brown. It's very rare, rarely clear. And when Naaman heard that, I mean, he was expecting the prophet to come out and go through some incantations and say, you know, magic words and he'd be healed or ask him to do something like climb a mountain and go kill some other enemies or... And he says, go wash. And it offended his pride. Here he's brought millions of dollars in gold and silver and clothing to pay for his healing. I think someone once calculated it was over $52 million in gold and silver had been sent by the king to heal Naaman of his leprosy. And he says, go wash. Well, he had just ridden by the Jordan River on his way to Israel. Uh, see, he's so mad, he turns his horse around, he begins to gallop off, and he said, the Bible says he left in a rage. He said, are not the rivers of Damascus, Abana, and Parfar clean, cleaner than all the waters in Israel? And uh, he thought his problem was leprosy. God knew his problem was pride. Good man, but he was proud. Pride is the mother of all sins. And on his way down to uh, Damascus, he had to ride by the Jordan River. And the soldiers came to him and they said, uh, Master, they drew near because they had been keeping their distance. He's contagious. They said, if he had asked you to do some hard thing, wouldn't you have done it? If he had said, you know, go conquer a thousand Philistines, you would have done it. That's what he's saying, wash. Naaman thought, well, you know, I'm going home to die. What have I got to lose? And he gets off his horse and he steps on down into the the river has to take off his clothes and his armor with his men watching. It's sort of a humbling experience. And the water's brown, and he, he gets off there, and he can see little clouds of mud coming up underneath his feet, and he thought, how can this possibly help? I said, Master, do it. So he goes, and he dunks himself the first time, and it comes up, and all he knows is it stings, and he's still got his leprosy. And he thinks, well, you know, why am I going through this? They said, no, he didn't say one time, Master, seven times. He dunks himself again and again, and he thought every time he dunked himself that it was washing away his leprosy. It was washing away his pride. Finally, after six times, he thought, oh, enough's enough, and he's going to get out. And they said, no, no, Master, he said seven times. Now, let me ask you a question. Does God mean what he says? Do numbers matter to God? When God told Joshua to march around Jericho seven times on the seventh day and you'll gain the victory, did they get the victory before? The Lord means what he says. And even with numbers. And when he says, I bless the seventh day, does God mean what he says? Does that mean we get to change it to whatever day we want? So Naaman obeyed and he went down the seventh time and something happened. He felt it. He had to feel it. He came up out of the water, leprosy was gone, any missing digits popped back into place. He was completely and totally healed. And he began to jump up and down in the river and make such a commotion, all the turtles ran off. The Bible says that his flesh was restored to him like the flesh of a little child. Now, I always think that it's such a paradox. Here you've got this strong, rugged soldier with baby skin. And I can just see his servants jumping up and down saying, praise the Lord, Master, can I pinch your cheek? This is wonderful. <laughs> you know, that's what a Christian is. We are soldiers in God's army, but we are like little children, born again. Well, this was one of the first times we see something connected with washing in the Jordan River and cleansing. 
Now, there were several miracles that happened in the Jordan River, and one of the greatest miracles was this is where Christ was anointed with the Holy Spirit because this is where John the Baptist began baptizing. And that is our subject for tonight. We're going to be talking about the subject of baptism. It is a prophecy subject. You look in Revelation chapter 14, verse 7, chapter 7, verse 14, sorry, and it says, These are those who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The Bible tells us that all of prophecy is redemptive. And so people who are coming to a prophecy seminar and saying, well, Doug, I don't want to know about salvation. I'm not interested in my salvation. I'm interested in the details. Do you realize that the heavy subjects that are coming now, if you're not born again, you're not going to understand. Jesus said, seeing they will not see, hearing they will not hear. But to those who consecrate themselves, he will give them ears to hear what the Spirit says to the church. That's in Revelation chapter 2. And so we, this is a subject where you say, all right, Lord, we're getting into deep water now, and I need to follow you and choose to say, Lord, you're my Savior. And so we're presenting this Bible subject because it really is a symbol of how God saves people from their sins. The children of Israel, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, they went through the Red Sea. This is way back in the Old Testament. And Paul says they were baptized in the sea. They didn't walk on the water. They went down. And God wants us to go down. Baptism is a symbol of death, burial, and resurrection. We're going to talk about that tonight. And maybe he's speaking to you or you who are watching now. As we move on into the future, we want you cleansed. We want your robes made white in the blood of the Lamb. First question in our lesson. What New Testament prophet used the Jordan River for baptizing or cleansing? You can read here in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. In those days, John the Baptist came preaching in the wilderness of Judea, and the people came from everywhere, and it says, Then Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about the Jordan went to him and were baptized by him in the Jordan River. Jordan in the Bible is a symbol of death. It is the lowest river in the world, and it represents like a humbling of ourselves. It also represents a burial. Then you come up out of the water, it represents a cleansing and a new birth. Now, we decided we're going to go out on the street again, and it's always interesting to just put a microphone to different people and say, what do you think this Bible truth means? And get their reaction. So we're going to do that now and do our, what we call our man on the street or woman on the street interviews. Um, baptism is, is really just an example of uh, letting, letting go and uh, accepting Jesus as your Lord and Savior. Uh, that was like specifically uh, directed to what we should do. It's dedicating your life to Christ. If you're going to really walk with the Lord, I think baptism is a way of stating your seriousness and that you really love him and you acknowledge you're a sinner and that he's, he gave you salvation. I would say a, 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 a washing, a cleansing, uh, more of a, from a spiritual sense. Being born again, born in Christ, um, starting a new life and journey with Jesus. Uh, just a new beginning, new start. Uh, like a refreshing of mind, basically washing away of your own sins, your old sins, and uh, um, you know, feeling reborn or giving yourself the ability to move forward in life too. Yeah, you know, a number of our candidates, they were actually pretty close to the truth, but you could see while they were answering the question, they were kind of pensive about their own lives, it seemed to me. There was a little self-introspection going on as they answered those questions, which is really appropriate. Have we asked God to give us that new beginning? Let's find out what the Bible says. Now, why are we talking about this? New Testament begins and ends with baptism. The Gospels begin and end with baptism. And it's something, a teaching that you find, especially in the book of Acts. And so while we're talking about the Lord being spirit-filled and understanding these spirit-given prophecies, where are you in your relationship with the Lord? Question two, what glorious Bible ceremony symbolizes a washing from the leprosy of sin? Acts 22, verse 16, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins, calling on the name of the Lord. 
Baptism is this ceremony. And John the Baptist, of course, was baptizing. Someone was asking, is this the, um, is this the first time baptism is mentioned in the Bible? Well, you've got the children of Israel going through the Red Sea. You've got Naaman. You've got the children of Israel walking across the Jordan or through the Jordan River when they came into the Promised Land, and it's like baptism. And um, the Bible says you must be born of the water and born of the Spirit. And so there's these two baptisms that happen. You've heard of being baptized in the Holy Spirit, and the water baptism is something that is a symbol of cleansing. Third question. According to the Bible, how many different kinds of baptism are acceptable? Well, the Bible says in Ephesians 4, verse 5, there is, you see it on your screen there, how many? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Not only does that mean there's one truth that we are baptized into, there's really one method of baptism in the Bible. But um, there's lots of different methods practiced in the world today. Now, as we found out, there's a lot of churches that are sort of drifting away from the clear commands of the Bible, and we start doing things that maybe are more culturally accepted or convenient. But God wants us to follow his word. Man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. There's a counterfeit for just about every, every truth of God, the devil's got a counterfeit. There's a counterfeit Holy Spirit out there, a counterfeit gospel, counterfeit Sabbath, counterfeit tongues, counterfeit baptisms. The devil confuses people with all of his counterfeits. And a lot of people have sort of changed it. But the Bible says, how many baptisms? One Lord, one faith, one baptism. Is the Lord important? Is faith important in the gospel? Is baptism important? According to the Bible writers, they gave it a priority. Question number four, what's the word baptize mean? The word baptism it comes from the Greek word baptizo, and that simply means to dip, to immerse, to plunge. You can find it in Greek literature where when they were dyeing cloth, they would take these big vats of purple or red dye, and they would plunge the cloth under so that the, the dye would sink into all the fibers and saturate things, and it would be adequately baptized or submerged. And so the Bible's pretty clear. The method of baptism that Jesus experienced that John the Baptist practiced, practiced, that Naaman experienced, was where they were immersed. The Lord wants us to be immersed in him. He wants us to be completely cleansed. It's not just, you know, washing your hands. It's a total consecration, and baptism represents that. That's why you read in Colossians 2.12, buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith, in the working of God who raised him from the dead. Baptism is compared to a, a death, a burial, and a resurrection. If uh, I tell you to go out in the back 40 of the ranch and bury a bag of garbage, and uh, I come out the next day and garbage is scattered all over the yard from raccoons and bears, and I'll say, did you bury it? And he said, no, I went out and sprinkled a little dirt on it, but sprinkling and burying, what's the difference? Does it make a difference? Does the method make a difference? Please listen carefully to this. When we get away from what God says, these sacred symbols, there's only a couple of sacred rites in the Christian church. The Lord's Supper, what we call communion, and baptism. Well, you could add marriage, but that's an, that even goes back to the Old Testament. But the New Testament, you've got the Lord's Supper, and you've got baptism. The devil really hates them. One example I'll give you is a pastor said, well, the bread and the grape juice, the bread and the wine, they are symbolic of the body and blood. And since they're symbols, why don't we do something more interesting in our church? For the Lord's Supper this week, we're going to have Coke and hamburgers. He said, it's just a symbol. We'll say the same prayer. Now, is it only me or does that start sounding sacrilegious? You lose the meaning when you get away from the precise teaching that God gives. And that's happening in so many different areas of the Christian faith. And so we're going to talk about what the Bible specifically says. What you do with that is up to you. But I'll tell you right now, before we're done tonight, I'm going to give you an opportunity to respond. I'm going to make an appeal because there's nothing more important than that. You know, if we have a production like this and 
we're teaching the Word, and we're not inviting people to respond to the main message of the Bible, which is accepting Christ, having their sins washed away, receiving eternal life, becoming new creatures, then all of this is a waste of time. Because what good is it when Jesus comes if you are biblically educated sinners? Isn't that right? What good will it be if you're lost? The most important thing is that you accept the salvation that the prophecies talk about. Jesus is our example. How was he baptized? If you're a Christian, you follow Jesus. What, what does the Bible say about him? Jesus came and was baptized by John in the Jordan, and immediately coming up from the water, he saw the heavens open. Is it pretty clear? He goes down in the water, he comes up from the water, John baptized in the Jordan, it's a river. You can also read where the Bible says that he baptized in Salim because there was much water there. If the method for baptizing was pouring or sprinkling, there's you know, a lot of counterfeit methods today. and, and uh, and I don't, I'm not trying to criticize. A lot of people are going to be in heaven that maybe we're not baptized biblically. You listening? God's going to save lots of people because I've already told you, you read in Acts chapter 17, it says in verse 30, at the times of this ignorance, God winked at. There's a lot of people that are doing the best with what they know to follow the Lord. None of us knows everything, right? At the time of our ignorance, he winks at. But now he commands men everywhere to repent. When we know the truth, we need to follow the truth. There's some churches, they sprinkle salt, and they call it baptism. And there's others that they put rose petals on you, and they call that baptism. And there's some, they just do words over the phone. It's called the dry cleaning method, and they call that baptism. And so there's a lot of counterfeit baptisms out there that aren't really what Jesus did. How did Philip baptize the treasure of Ethiopia? You've got this amazing story in the Bible where uh, Philip is the first hitchhiker in the Bible. And he gets a ride in the chariot with this very esteemed Ethiopian treasure who's just come from Jerusalem worshiping. He believes in Jehovah. He's on his way back. He serves under Candace, the queen of Ethiopia, and he's reading the scroll of Isaiah. Philip jumps up in the chariot and says, I can explain this to you. And he preaches about Christ from Isaiah 60. I think he's reading Isaiah 53. And um, after he hears about Jesus, he said, here's water. What prevents me from being baptized? Philip said, if you believe with all your heart, nothing. Now listen to what the Bible says. So they got out of the chariot. They went into the water. Acts chapter 8, verse 38. Both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water, and he baptized him. And the Bible says, now when they had come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away. This is an amazing story. First of all, Ethiopia traces its Christianity to this man back in the time of Christ that he was one of the first to introduce it. Secondly, the Lord sent Philip all the way down in the desert for a rendezvous with one man so he could teach him and then baptize him. And as soon as the baptism was done, he goes on to preach somewhere else. So how important is it to the Lord that he would do that? In fact, this is the first time in the Bible it tells us that the Lord beamed the person like Star Trek from one place to another. As soon as Philip got done with the baptism, it says the Lord caught him away, and he found himself walking down the road to Caesarea. It says, you finished your job here. You've obeyed me. I'm going to save you having to walk all the way. I'm going to transport you. That's what he did. Number seven, what other truths are symbolized in baptism? Therefore, we are buried with him through baptism, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in a newness of life. For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly shall we be in the likeness of his resurrection. And baptism is a symbol of a death, but it's not only just a death, it's a burial, and then it's a resurrection. You know, when a person uh, is born again, they like take a, a first breath. I remember hearing about this uh, baptism here in Northern California. There was this uh, Spanish gentleman, and, and he told the pastor, he said, you know, I've, I've lived a pretty wild life. And he said, when you baptize me, and he, he said, I want to get baptized in the lake. And he said, uh, when you baptize me, um, he said, I I'm a good swimmer. He said, I want to have a prayer while I'm underwater. Now, he told the pastor this just before the baptism. They're out in the lake together. All his family are watching from the shore. 
He says, you hold me under, under, I'll squeeze your hand when I'm done with my prayer and you can bring me up. Pastor said, all right. Usually, you know, they baptize a person, they just immerse them and you bring them right up again. It just, it's, you know, important you don't hold them under. So the pastor said, I baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And he put them down. I need you to hold them there. And people on the shore are shifting back and forth and they're wondering if they're going to charge out in the lake and attack the pastor. What's he trying to do, drown him? And then he, he squeezed his hand, he brought him back up again. Then he explained to everybody, I, I wanted to just have a prayer <laughs> while I was underwater. But uh, usually, one of the ways you tell a person is dead, they stop breathing. And so, at least for that moment that you hold your breath while you're underwater, it's like, I'm dying to my old ways. When a baby's born, it comes out of an envelope of water and it takes its breath. And we all worry when it doesn't take that first breath, right? That first cry is a symbolic of a new birth. How important is baptism? The Bible tells us, Mark 16, 16. Pastor Doug, why are you talking about this subject? He who believes and is baptized will be saved. Does that sound important? But he who does not believe will be condemned. You notice the emphasis is on belief. Will there be some people in heaven who were not baptized? Well, sure, you've got all these characters in the Old Testament who will be saved, and it doesn't tell us that they practice baptism as a rite back then. What about the thief on the cross who died next to Jesus? Will he be saved? Why was Jesus baptized? Was Jesus baptized for his sin? No. Jesus is baptized as an example for you and me. Another reason that I believe Jesus was baptized, Jesus did not die for his sin, he died for mine. I get credit for his death. I think there are going to be people like that thief on the cross who turn to Jesus in the closing hours of their life and they cannot practically accommodate a baptism, and the Lord gives them credit for his baptism. Because he certainly wasn't baptized to wash away his sin. There's sometimes, you know, I'll visit someone in a hospital, and they're in the closing days or hours of their life, and they're hooked up to apparatus, and they say, Pastor Doug, uh, I want to accept the Lord. Well, they, they can't be baptized, but can they accept the Lord and have their sins forgiven? Yes. I do remember one dear sister um, in, in the closing days of her life, she asked me to baptize her. But when, when she told me she was in a, in a bed, she was down to like 60 pounds and she was never going to make it to a church. And she said, oh, please baptize me. Please baptize me. She understood from reading the word. She'd just been reading the Bible as she was dying from cancer. And I said, what can we do? She said, my bathtub. And her son picked her up. She didn't weigh anything. And we baptized her in her bathtub. And I've never seen such peace as I saw on her face. And so sometimes you, you, there's extraordinary things. I've been to prisons before where people get baptized in a horse trough because they say it's important to follow what Jesus teaches. It's that important. They go to great lengths. But some people, they're on death row. They come to Christ. They can't be baptized. Jesus will give them credit for his baptism. Third reason Jesus was baptized is to show you and me what to expect when we are baptized. But I'll elaborate on that a little more in a few moments. Is it important? Listen to what Jesus said to Nicodemus. Unless one is born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter. That's pretty absolute. He cannot enter the kingdom of God. Well, we all know being baptized and born of the spirit is important, but is being born of the water? Some people say, well, Pastor Doug, that's not talking about baptism. That's talking about physical birth when a baby's in that envelope of water and the water breaks and then they're born. Unless you're born of the water. Now, wait a second. You're saying that means unless you're born of a woman and born of the Spirit. Why would Jesus say that? Question. How many here were born of a woman? Just Anyone not born of a woman? I mean, these are strange days we're living in now, so you don't know. So why would Jesus say something so redundant? Of course, everyone's born of a woman. He's not. He's, the Gospel of John starts with John the Baptist. And then you get to chapter 3 and he tells Nicodemus, unless you're born of the water and of the Spirit. He said, now, what's the difference? You and I cannot pick the time when God's going to baptize us with the Holy Spirit. We can ask. But he does it. Sometimes he does it suddenly. Pentecost, it says suddenly. 
you and I can choose when we are baptized by water. Baptism is like a, a beautiful marriage where you want both parties to participate in the choice. And so it's basically saying, unless you are born of the water, your choice, and born of the Spirit, my choice, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. When the children of Israel came out of Egypt, the Bible says they went through the Red Sea, baptized in water, and God sent a pillar of fire. They're baptized in fire. Water baptism, fire baptism, new person, new nation. When they came out of that water and they were baptized in the cloud of fire, they became a new nation. You know, even our world is getting both baptisms. The days of Noah, the world was washed with water. Peter says this next time it's not going to be water, but the heavens will dissolve with a great noise and the elements will melt with fervent heat. The earth and the works in it will be burned up. Next time he said it's going to be baptized in fire. And then God will make a new earth. So even our world is going to go through both baptisms before it's made new. You need both baptisms as well. What blessed ceremony can be compared to baptism? I already gave you a little peek into it. It's a symbol of like marriage. And you can read in Galatians 3.27. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. It's, in, it's like putting on the wedding garment. Now, baptism is as important to a Christian as a wedding is to a marriage. Typically, though there's exceptions, baptisms are public. Most people want others to know about their wedding. Uh, love must be involved. Faith must be involved. It's a, it's a consecration. It's a commitment. And again, you can read... Um, oh, uh, we're going to jump to number 10, sorry. Question number 10. What command did Jesus give to his people? What command did Jesus give to his people just before his ascension? He said, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So the Lord wants us to go everywhere and to teach and to baptize. And he says, baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Now, when you get to the New Testament, you get to the book of Acts, it says, go baptize in the name of the Lord, baptize in the name of the Lord Jesus. And I know some churches argue about the exact wording to be uttered during the baptism, baptism ceremony. I, I think that the Bible doesn't make a big argument about the exact wording. It's pretty clear that they're being baptized into the Lord of Scripture, Jehovah, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Lord Jesus. You know, when I do a wedding, I'll have the man and the woman there, and I'll go over the vows with them ahead of time, and I'll say, you know, there's several ways we can do this. I said, there's certain things that must be in this covenant. You're doing it publicly. You're making promises to each other. I said, do you want the more formal wording where I say, you, William, you know, Jones, Smith, or whatever the name is, and do you, Sally, um, McBride, or, and they, you, do you want the whole name? Or they said, no, do you, Bill, take Sally? I said, well, you know, whatever you want. It's a legal document. Have you noticed that when you scribble your signature, it's still legal? Yeah. So some churches make a big deal about the exact wording during the baptism. I know of one, uh, one church, I know the pastor, and he was baptizing this uh, uh, Latin gentleman, and he, the pastor did not speak Spanish, but he wanted to accommodate and he wanted to say, in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in Spanish. And he practiced it, and he practiced it. And finally, when the gentleman came down in the baptistry to get baptized, instead of saying, in el nombre de la Padre, y Hijo, y Espíritu Santo, or something like that, he said, in el nombre de la Papa, which is the Pope. <laughs> so, um, I think the angels laugh, too, when stuff like that happens. <laughs> You're all wondering, well, what did he do? I, I, think, I think baptism still worked. <laughs> he did his best. So what are the criteria? Number 11, what biblical qualifications must precede baptism? This is where it gets really important. Before a person's baptized, what do they need to know? Well, it says, for one thing, they need to understand the teachings of Jesus. Matthew 28, 19. He said, go therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, teaching them to absorb all things whatsoever I've commanded you. Lo, I'm with you to the end of the world. This is a very important statement, but he said, there's teaching that comes before. You don't stop learning after baptism. You continue to be taught whatsoever the Lord commands after baptism. 
You know, I've been baptized twice. First time I was baptized, some of you heard my testimony. I was uh, living in the mountains in a cave. I lived by myself. I'd accepted Jesus on my own, just praying after reading the Bible. And I remember one day that two hikers came up the trail, and that you had to go by my cave to go up to the top of Mount San Jacinto. It's an 11,000-foot mountain, often has snow on it. And I lived right on the creek. And they came into the yard. They stopped to rest a little bit. And they said, are you a Christian? And they were just very dedicated Calvary Baptist Christians. And I said, what in fact, yeah, I, I have accepted the Lord. I'm a Christian. They said, have you been baptized? Well, you know, I'd been reading about it, but it, I, I hadn't been at that point. They said, you need to be baptized. And they quoted two or three of these scriptures about the importance of baptism. I said, yes, I'm convinced. So one of them took me off in the water outside my cave. I had a deep pool and a waterfall. It was a beautiful place. And he took me off and and it was melted snow. And he took me off in the water, and we both courageously went down. I came back up again. I can promise you, I felt born again. And as uh, soon as they got done baptizing me, they went hiking up on the trail. They were rejoicing. They got to baptize me. And I thought, this is great. I'm a Christian now. I got to go tell my friends. So I went down to Palm Springs, and I got together with my friends. I said, let's get some beer and celebrate. I got baptized today. And before the sun went down that day, I was in jail <laughs> telling the people in jail about how I got baptized that day. I had not been taught properly yet. So, you know, people need to be taught the basics. Uh, now, before you get married, do you need to know everything about the person? You ought to know the main things, right? Is there still stuff that you learn after you get married? I, I heard somebody go, oh, yeah. <laughs> So you must be taught the, the fundamental teachings of the Bible and accept them. And that's the next point. Believe all of the teachings of Jesus. Say, yes, I, I embrace them. I believe the teachings of Jesus. Be willing to repent of your past sins. Now, that means a sorrow for sin and a turning away from sin. Um, let me ask the ladies, if a man came to you and said, I love you, I'd like to get married, uh, and we've been dating for a little while. Uh, and I think if we got married, I could stop, da stop dating the other girls. What would you say to a proposal like that? Yeah. Crazy. But there are people who say, Pastor Doug, if you baptize me, I think I can stop these major addictions and sins in my life. No. John the Baptist said, bring, bring forth fruits, meat of repentance in advance. In other words, repent of your sins, turn from your sins, and make that covenant. You don't get baptized in order to love the Lord. Some people have said, I think if you just baptize me, then I'll love the Lord. No, you want to consecrate yourself to the Lord, be converted, and be baptized. And uh, I, I remember I wanted to get baptized. This is the second time. I wanted to get baptized, and a really godly pastor, he said, well, Doug, how's the smoking coming? I said, Pastor, I got a scripture for you. It's not what goes in your mouth that defiles you, but it's what comes out. I said, well, Doug, what goes in your mouth is defiling what comes out of your mouth. And while I was arguing with the pastor, I was in my pickup truck. He's standing at the window. I met him at the post office. I'm sitting down. Three old, two-year-old girl is on the seat, Rachel. And uh, while I'm talking to him and saying, it's okay if I smoke. God knows I love him. I believe the Bible. She took my cigarettes and started shaking the pack, and they began to fly out. He said, see that? She is going to do what you do, not what you say. And I thought, oh, I became convicted. And you know what? God gave me victory. I quit smoking two weeks before I got baptized. I've not had one in 40 years. The Lord, but I, I made the decision. Quitting smoking is easy. Mark Twain said, I've done it 100 times. <laughs> no, but I quit, and I stayed quit. <laughs> Repent of your past sins. Repent and turn. And that's the next verse, Romans 6, verse 5 and 6, and Luke 3, verse 7 and 8. Agree to turn from your life of sin. Be willing to say, Lord, I want to follow you. Jesus gives you the power to change before your baptism. He gives you the power to change before your baptism. And so don't worry that, you know, I don't get the power until I get baptized. Baptism is a ceremony, like a marriage. The love must come first. The commitment must come first. You don't say, if I got married, then I think I can be committed. 
don't, don't marry that person. Accept Christ as a personal savior and experience the new birth. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and John 3, and uh, verses 3 and 5. Where did all these other counterfeit forms of baptism originate? You read in Mark 7, verse 8, For laying aside the commandment of God, you hold to the tradition of men. It didn't happen overnight. All the early churches practiced baptism by immersion. Um, you can go look at the ruins. Uh, we were in Israel not long ago, and you could see the different churches from the Byzantine area, and they built the church around a baptistry. Um, they even found a cave that had a baptistry in it by the Jordan River. They're wondering if it was John the Baptist cave that was uh, recently excavated, recently meaning in the last 15 years. And um, so no question that the early method for baptism was immersion because it represented a washing, it represented a death, a burial, a new birth. But over time, people start changing things for convenience. Sometimes someone would be sick and they say, well, they got to get baptized, but they can't go and get baptized. So they dip a sheet in the water and then they wrap them in the sheet and they say, well, this is like baptism. Well, they're trying. Or some of the royalty would say, you know, we want to get baptized, but it's sort, of, it's sort of a messy business. Get all wet in front of everybody. By the way, you know, uh, baptisms compared to birth and to death, and they're pretty messy too. Isn't that right? You don't see too many pretty deaths or pretty births. And uh, so the royalty would say, can't you just, since it's a symbol, just sprinkle a little on us or pour a little on us? Do we have to get down in the water in front of all of our subjects and and gradually they started doing both pouring and sprinkling and immersion and then it became a little uh, more popular to do the, the simpler things until it just changed and everybody sort of then some churches say it's not baptism in the water that matters it's just baptism in the holy spirit you can read historically in uh, AD 311 it was the council of ravenna there that sprinkling and pouring were officially accepted as equally valid as immersion in the rite of baptism. Over a thousand years after Christ, everybody was being baptized like the Baptists do it, by immersion. They're absolutely right. It, it does matter. Number 13, what does the Bible say about those who put the teaching of men before the truth of God? Jesus said, Matthew chapter 15, verse 9, in vain they worship me, teaching his doctrines the commandments of men. Just that verse applies to a lot of areas where people are teaching doctrines that are nothing more than the commandments of men. A lot of man-made traditions and practices have crept into Christianity where you've got this virtual melting pot of different doctrines that can't be found anywhere in the Bible. Paul goes on to say in Galatians chapter 1, verse 8, but even if we or an angel from heaven preaches any other gospel to you than that which we have preached, let him be accursed. That's pretty strong language for the apostle. He said, even if it's an angel of heaven, if he's preaching something other than the word of God, and those were holy men inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, let them be accursed. So how does God feel about when we twist and change and transform and modify and adjust the plain, thus saith the Lord? There's reasons for everything God says. And you know what? Sometimes, even if we don't understand all the reasons, don't argue with God. Don't forget what I'm going to say. When in doubt, follow Jesus. Amen. When in doubt, do the safe thing. It is always safer to do what the Word says because then you can stand before the Lord in the judgment and say, Lord, this is what you said in your Word. If that wasn't the truth, then where is the truth? If it's not in the Word of God, where is it? Thy word is truth. Those are the words of Jesus. If you believe anything the Bible says about Jesus, believe what he says. Thy word is truth. The word is very clear on this subject. But doesn't baptism of the Holy Spirit replace baptism by immersion? No, need both. You can read where in Acts chapter 2, the apostles were baptized by John the Baptist, but then at Pentecost, they're baptized in the Holy Spirit. And then Peter told them after the Holy Spirit had been poured out, he says in Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized every one of you. He says, repent and let every one of you be baptized. And so repentance and baptism, they made it clear all through. Even Paul, when he was converted, Ananias came to Paul and he said, uh, 
I've been sent by the Lord to baptize you. Paul had been converted. And so connected with your decision to say, I want to be a Christian. I want my sins washed away. I want to follow the Lord is this sacred right that encompasses that commitment, that covenant that you're making. Now, I told you, you may not know everything about a person before you get married. You need to know the basics. There needs to be a commitment. But don't wait until you feel like you're perfect. Because if you wait until you feel like you're perfect before you get baptized, nobody will ever get baptized. Even after Peter, James, and John were baptized, you see that they weren't quite perfect yet. In fact, Peter said, Lord Jesus, depart from me. I'm a sinful man. That's in Luke chapter 5. Jesus said, when you're converted, Peter, that's long after his baptism. So you want to make your commitment, but don't say, I I've got to make sure that I'm perfect, or you'll never get there. And furthermore, Acts chapter 2, verse 38, baptize in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So you got water baptism, spirit baptism. Now, you'll notice biblically those baptisms might happen at different times. In Acts chapter 10, Cornelius, this Roman centurion and his household, they are baptized with the Holy Spirit. And Peter said, wow, they got baptized with the Holy Spirit and they haven't been baptized with water yet. Who can forbid that we baptize them with water? So he said, let's do both baptisms. He baptizes them with water. Then you've got where Jesus is baptized, the Holy Spirit and the water baptism happen at the same time. Then you've got where the apostles get baptized by water and later get baptized by the Holy Spirit. So it can happen in different ways according to the Bible. But what you do see consistently, we need both baptisms. I know some churches, they just teach baptism by water. Big emphasis. I know some churches and all they talk about is the Holy Spirit. And the Bible says you need both, really. Is rebaptism ever proper? Well, I already mentioned the first time I got baptized, uh, I didn't really understand what I was doing. And a few years later, I was baptized, and I did understand the teachings. And as you can tell, I committed my life to sharing and living those teachings. But in Acts chapter 19, Paul and uh, uh, Silas were traveling through Ephesus, and they ran into 12 believers up there. Interesting number. These are Gentile believers. It's like another <laughs> different kinds of 12 from the 12 Jews. And they're hearing about Christ and they're, they're looking a little confused. And Paul said to them, and this is Acts 19, verse 2, said, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you believed? They said, we've not as so much as heard whether there is a Holy Spirit. And he said, into what then were you baptized? They said, John's baptism, meaning John the Baptist, who baptized by immersion, by the way, the right kind. But they had been baptized by John the Baptist before Jesus came and began his ministry, then they went back north. They did not have newspapers, telephones, wireless texting back then. They didn't know what had happened with Christ's ministry. And it says in Acts chapter 19, verse 4, Then Paul said, Indeed, John baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him who would come after him. That is on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. They were rebaptized. So there's three reasons for rebaptism. One is maybe you are baptized as a baby. Now, do we realize from what we studied earlier, when it says in order to be baptized, you need to, you need to repent, and you need to uh, believe in all these things that babies can't be taught, they can't repent. It is appropriate to dedicate babies. Bible says Jesus' parents dedicated him as a baby, and a lot of people take their babies to church and they call it a baptism, but it really is a dedication. Baptism is something that we choose. Jesus was dedicated as a baby. He was baptized as an adult. And that's really the way it ought to work. Now, you didn't know better. The Lord will bless. Number 16. Oh, I was going to tell you three reasons. Get uh, rebaptism is for, if you weren't baptized biblically, sprinkling or pouring or some other method that is not immersion. If you were... Uh, uh, you, like I said, you may be baptized as a baby and you didn't know what these things were. Or you come into a whole new understanding of what the truth is. I heard about a Baptist pastor. He came to some meetings like this. He learned the Sabbath truth. And he said, I want to get rebaptized." And we said, well, you're a Baptist. You were baptized by immersion, right? I said, yeah, but I've been baptized into nine commandments. I want to get baptized into all ten. 
And so like these Ephesian men, he was rebaptized. And the third reason is if you've backslidden from the Lord, you kind of divorce yourself from the Lord. I'm not talking about missing church for a week. You know, God has, God has the communion service for us to get our new beginning. But um, you need to be remarried if you've, you know, gone into a far country like that prodigal son. You may talk to the pastor about rebaptism. Is baptism connected with joining a church? Then those who gladly received his word were baptized and that day there were 3,000 souls added to them. You are baptized, you need to be part of a church family. A baby lamb that is born and left out in the woods without a shepherd and a flock is an easy prey for the wolves. And uh, ladies, what would you say to a man that said, I love you, I've stopped dating all the other girls, I want to marry you, but do we need to live in the same house? Would you say, what? <laughs> Something wrong with your commitment. And so when you're baptized, some people say, I want to get baptized. I don't want to join a church. Well, the Bible doesn't have any other option. It says we are baptized into Christ, into his body. You can read in Acts chapter 2, 47, praising God and having favor with all the people and the church and the Lord added to the church daily those who are being saved. The ones being saved were added to the church. Church is the body of Christ. We all have different parts and gifts and, and talents that we bring together. Colossians 3, verse 15, you are called in one body. We're to come together. And yeah, I know sometimes that people might be a challenge, but that's where you learn to love, right? Uh, were there imperfect people in Jesus' church? Did he have a Judas? And would you have joined Jesus' church back when he walked the earth? So don't wait until you feel like there's the perfect church. He wants us to be part of his family. We, we get our nurture there. And it goes on to say, and he is the head of the body, the church. 1 Corinthians 12, verse 13, for by one spirit we are all baptized into one body. Number 17, if I refuse baptism, whose counsel am I refusing? Luke 7, but the Pharisees and the lawyers rejected the will of God for themselves, not having been baptized by him. Whose counsel are we rejecting? They rejected the counsel of God when they said they didn't want to be baptized by John the Baptist. This is not the teaching of Pastor Doug or a church. This is the teaching of the Word of God. And it's pretty clear. You would think the last statement of Jesus, go therefore teach and baptize, should be a first priority for Christians or people who want to be Christians. When Jesus was baptized, what did his father say? You can look here in Mark chapter 1, verse 9. It came to pass in those days that Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And then a voice came from heaven saying, you are my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. When we are baptized, God adopts us. He says we are his beloved son or daughter and he is well pleased. How many of us want to know that God is well pleased with us? He looks upon us as though we have never sinned and all of our sins washed away. Now, I told you that um, we're going to encourage you to make a decision tonight. And I'd like to have our, uh, our ushers here that have volunteered. Give a card to every person, if you would. And you also have this available if you're watching online and you look at the Panorama of Prophecy website. I'm going to invite you to make a decision that could be measured in eternity tonight. You know, the Bible tells us one day a man filled with a leprosy came to Jesus. And everybody shrank back because he had this terrible, ugly, contagious disease. But Jesus stayed there. And he knelt before Christ and he said, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. And Jesus said, I will. He not only said it, he reached out and he touched him. And he was healed from his leprosy. It was a miracle. The Lord can save you from the leprosy of sin, whatever your sins are. Do you want to hear God say, you are my beloved son and daughter? Please take your card, and I'd like you to put your pertinent information on there, your name, phone, or email. And I want to ask you these questions, and then I'm going to have John sing while you fill out these cards. Your first question, you can just check the mark there. I have accepted Jesus as my Savior, and I desire to be baptized by immersion. And nobody's going to force you to do anything, but you begin with a decision. If tonight you want to say, Lord, I think you're speaking to my heart, I want to make that decision. Please write that on your envelope. Second question. 
Maybe you've already been baptized by immersion. You can mark that there. And you say, I've made that decision. Question number three. I was baptized by immersion, but I've drifted away, and I'd like to consider being rebaptized. And then the final question. I still have questions on this subject. You want more information? And maybe I'd like to talk to uh, one of our, our Bible teachers or pastor. We want to pray with you. You know, this is the most important thing. Jesus said, go, teach, baptize. That's what we're doing. Making no apologies about it because these are the words of Christ. He wants you to be washed from your sins. Mark, in chapter 1, it says, a voice came from heaven when Christ was baptized. You can also read in John cha or Matthew chapter 3, when Christ was baptized, the heavens opened and the Holy Spirit came down. He would like you to have that experience. It says, they heard a voice from heaven. You will hear. They saw the Spirit coming like a dove. The Holy Spirit will come into your life in a special way with that commitment, and he's got a work for you to do. How many of you want to be in that land of new beginnings? God wants you to have that new birth, to have your sins washed away. And I pray that you'll all make that decision tonight. For those in our local audience, please return your cards to your ushers. We want to pray for you and help you follow up in that decision. Those who are watching, let us know. Go to the panoramaprophecy.com website if you've made your decision. We think this is such an important study right now because in the lessons and the subjects that are yet to come, we want you to understand and we need to consecrate ourselves right now to have that understanding. I'd like to pray with you as we close. Loving Lord, thank you so much for your presence that Jesus did come to wash away the leprosy of sin and give us a new beginning. We accept that now. In Christ's name we pray, amen.